Hello and welcome back to another episode in this low-level JavaScript series on building a 16-bit virtual machine. In the last episode, I introduced the concept of the stack and I showed how it can be used as a method for data storage that abstracts away the actual addressing of memory and how the mechanics of this system can be used to create a systematic approach to subroutines, which allows for modular machine code. If you missed that episode, I strongly recommend checking out that episode first, as it does provide a lot of important context. Links can be found on screen now and in the description. Today, we're going to create the concrete coded implementation of the stack. So to start out, we have two new registers. We have the stack pointer and we have the frame pointer. I'm going to add those as the next two registers after the general purpose registers. But now the question is, where does the stack actually begin in this machine? This is actually quite a complex question for reasons that I will get into in the next episode. But for now, let's keep things as simple as possible and we'll say that it starts at the very end of memory. This means we have to set both the stack pointer and the frame pointer to the number of bytes that we have in memory, minus one, minus one. The first minus one because we need two bytes to store a 16-bit value, so we need that extra byte. And the second minus one because we're dealing with zero indexed memory here, so we need to actually make sure we're starting from zero. And with those properly set up, let's move on to the mechanical instructions. First up, we've got push, where we push an item onto the stack. While there's just one push instruction from the point of view of our assembly language, there are actually two machine instructions. One where we push a literal value and one where we push the contents of a register. We can add those in with the values from the instruction table that I showed a few videos back. So we have OX17 for push literal and OX18 for push register. For a literal, we need to get the value with fetch 16, and then we can set that value at the address of the stack pointer. And then we have to decrement the stack pointer by two. I'm actually gonna move this logic into another method called push, which takes a value and handles the mechanical parts of the stack. That simplifies our actual instruction a little bit. And now we have push register. So for this, we need to get the register index. And we've done this quite a few times before in the code elsewhere. But I'm also going to extract this to a method too. I'm going to call it fetch register index. And that's going to add a little bit of extra expressivity in the code so we can really see what's going on. I'm going to replace the old instances with this new method. And then we can return to our push register implementation and grab the register index. Then we can get the value from the register and we can push it. So what about pop? Well, there's only one pop instruction. Let's add it to instructions.js and create its implementation. We first need to get a register index. And since the stack pointer is decreased after a value is pushed, in order to get the last value on the stack, we actually first need to increment the stack pointer. Then we can just get the value that the address now points at and set that in the register.
And again, I'm going to extract most of this logic and put it into a pop method that we can use more expressively. Now that we have push and pop, we can actually check that they're working correctly. I'm going to add constants for all of the registers now, just so it's a little bit easier to reference them in machine code. Let's write a simple program that moves some values into R1 and R2 and then uses pushes and pops to swap the contents of the two registers. This should be quite straightforward to translate into machine code. First, we move literals into the two registers. Next, we push the contents of those two registers. And finally, we pop into the corresponding registers. We can use our view memory app method to view the contents of the stack since it's just regular memory. The size of our memory is 256 times 256 bytes. That's actually OXFFFF bytes. So the stack actually starts at OXFFFF minus one. And since the stack grows upwards, and view memory app shows us the following seven bytes. Let's also minus another six bytes so we can see the eight bytes from the beginning of the stack. Running this program through, we can see that we are able to load the value into R1 and then R2. And then we have an OX18 instruction. It's the first push of the R1 register. After running it, we can see that the stack pointer has been decremented by two and the memory representing the stack now contains this OX5151. Then we have another push, this time to R2, and the same thing happens again. The stack pointer is decremented and the value OX4242 is now on the stack, just ahead of OX5151. Then we have the 1A instruction. That's a pop into the R1 register which both increments the stack pointer and places the value OX4242 into the R1 register. Then another, which does the same, but this time places OX5151 into R2. So that does appear to be working nicely. And now that we have those basic stack mechanics in place, we can start to build on them to implement the more abstract subroutine mechanics for the call and return instructions. We can start with the call instructions. There are actually two call instructions that we can use. The first uses a literal value to specify where in memory the subroutine actually is. And the second gets the subroutine address from a register. Both are useful in different circumstances. To implement call literal, we first need to get the address with a fetch 16. Then we need to go through the process of saving the current CPU state to the stack. First, we can push all the general purpose registers to the stack, R1 through R8. Then the instruction pointer, which we can think of as the return address of this subroutine. And now, if you remember back to the previous episode, we also had to save the size of the stack in order for the frame pointer to be properly restored. That also implies that we need to keep track of the stack size somewhere. This is fairly simple for us to implement because we actually only interact with the stack via our push and pop methods. So we can add a property to the CPU called stack frame size. This could be a register, but I don't want the value to be user controlled. So we can think of it as a kind of internal register. In the push method, this property needs to be increased by two on every push. And in the pop method, we do the opposite. We decrement it by two. Now we can actually record the size of this stack frame in the stack. 
We need to add two to it though, in order to account for the two bytes that this actually takes up, this stack size. The last two things we need to do are move the frame pointer to where the stack currently points at, and then to reset the stack frame size to zero so that the new stack frame can be tracked in the same way as before. And that way, of course, if it were to call a subroutine, it would also be able to save its state successfully. So now we've saved the CPU state, we can safely set the instruction pointer to the subroutine address that we need to jump to. Since we have multiple call instructions, we can extract this state saving logic into a method and call it push state, which will greatly simplify the implementation of call literal. It also simplifies the implementation of call from register, which is pretty much the same thing. But instead of fetching the address directly, we first need to go via a register. So we can fetch the register index that holds the address. Then we can get the address itself. And then we can push the state and set the instruction pointer to the address we got. For the return instruction, we kind of need to implement the reverse process. We can already put this into a pop state method to correspond to our push state method. The first thing we need to do here is to get the address inside the frame pointer. We can safely already set the stack pointer to this address, since any values that were built up during the course of the subroutine can be safely ignored now. When we actually come to build a higher level language later, this will be what it concretely means for variables in a function to go out of scope. So if we call this.pop, that's going to give us the size of the old stack frame. We're going to need that a little bit later on, so I'm going to copy this value to a temporary variable of the same name. Then we can begin to pop into the registers. We need to do it in the reverse order to before, so we start with the instruction pointer moving down through the general purpose registers. After that comes the number of arguments that were passed to this subroutine. We can use this to call pop that number of times, which will bring the stack pointer to just before we pushed any arguments on the stack at all. Finally, we can set the frame pointer to the beginning of this frame, which is the current frame pointer value plus the stack frame size. And the actual implementation of the return instruction is really just a call to the pop state method and a return. We're almost ready to test this out, but first I want to make one small change to view memory at. I want to add a new argument to this method called n which says how many bytes we see around the memory. This way we can see further back into the stack. Here is an assembly language program that we can implement in order to test our subroutine implementation. There are really two distinct parts here, the main program, and the subroutine, which begins at address 0x3000 in memory. The reason to add these pushes at the beginning here is so that we can test that the stack is properly preserved. When we return from the subroutine, we would expect these values to still be on the stack. Similarly, I want to put some values into the registers, just so we can be sure that they are also properly restored. This function actually has no arguments, but we still need to push zero to the stack to indicate that. And we can use the call literal here. In the assembly language, we would use the label, but 
Here we have to use the concrete value 3000. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a variable called subroutine address that we can address thinking of it as our label. I'm also going to add one more instruction after the subroutine call, which will help us determine if the stack actually has been properly preserved. Now, by setting i to the value of the subroutine address, we can start to place code later in the memory. So first of all, let's add some pushes to check that the new stack frame is functioning the way we expect it to. Let's alter some registers as well. And finally, we'll return. Since we're going to be pushing so many values to the stack, let's add some more bytes in the view memory at. I think 44 bytes should be more than enough. And let's give it a shot. Everything starts off empty, of course. And the first three pushes do seem to end up correctly on the stack. The values 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5, 6, 7, 8 are indeed also correctly written to R1 and R4. We push 0, which isn't directly visible, but we can see the stack pointer did change from OXFFF8 to FFF6. And that brings us to the call literal instruction, OX5E, pointing to the address 3000. When we run this, a lot of things actually change. We jump to address 3000, and the stack and frame pointers both ended up at OXFFE2. We're able to see that the registers have been saved to the stack, including the return address. The size of the stack, 1c, is also visible there. When we execute the push instruction, we see the value 0102 get pushed to the stack, just in front of the size of the previous stack frame. And we see a similar thing happening with the next two pushes. So it looks like the new stack frame is pushing values as expected. We run the next two move literal to register instructions. We can see that the R1 register is overwritten and R8 gets a new value. And finally, we get to our return instruction. All the registers are correctly restored. And finally, just to check that the stack is also properly preserved, let's execute this last push instruction we can see that that puts the value OX4444 just in front of OX1111. That was the third value that we pushed to the stack that we wanted to preserve. Everything does seem to be working as expected. Now we have a concrete implementation for the stack, both the simple stack mechanics and the more abstract data structure based stack that pushes and pops CPU states. In the next episode, we're gonna take a look at memory mapped IO to understand how we can use the machine's address space to do much more than just load and store values. It's a really cool concept and it's going to be really important when we turn this into a fantasy console later. I really hope you've enjoyed this installment of building a 16-bit VM. Thanks to all the patrons whose support massively helps this channel. If you'd like exclusive access to scripts, Q&A, and other materials that don't quite make it to the channel, then head over to patreon.com forward slash low-level JavaScript and become a supporter for as little as a dollar an episode. And if you can't, then no problem. Just watching and spreading the word is absolutely enough. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.